I'm curious about this, um, this trickster that, um, I, I, tell me if I, I don't know if it's wrong or right, maybe it's probably neither, but uh, to me, when I think of the trickster and when it, however, this archetype, this form emerges, mm -hmm. I think what comes up for me is it's beckoning us to acknowledge the unseen. Mm -hmm. Like it's there to kind of remind you that as you talked about here with our, maybe our, um, our self-centeredness or our attempt to control yeah. things in an understandable linear utilitarian fashion. And yeah. that the trickster is there to remind you that no such thing can truly happen or exist. And that is yeah. maybe a projection of sorts. Is yeah. that, is yeah. that how, um, say Eshu would be perceived as well as um, being excuse sorry go on no no i hear you brother go ahead with your, your question with i i just think that I, I think what is impoverished or lacking maybe and i could use this the west or whatever yeah. is yeah. this impoverishment this lack of understanding of the uh, of that trickster of what it's like, there's no place for the trickster, not really in our, uh, cosmologies, you know? Yeah. 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 So I think that the trickster can emerge in ways that are rather disturbing and frightening, like this pandemic, it emerges as a, as a way to, to, to present the unseen to us as a way of, of having our, having its way with us, so to speak. Yeah. And because we don't acknowledge the unseen and maybe we don't speak to it on its own terms, that it will have its way with us in some form or another. Yeah. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense because we don't know how to meet these entities. We don't know how to be. Um, and I don't think any of this is exclusively wrapped up in the wrapping paper of ancestrality. I feel that we're constantly at the edge of ancestrality. That is, um, even right now, um, ancestor, an ancestor work is not simply or unilaterally about looking to the past. I think it's also about dwelling in the thick now um, and, and meeting the challenge of experimentation and invention um, and visioning and and falling apart and humbling ourselves um and, and we don't ever do this we don't ever do this on our own you know so modernity has um ironically you know in its attempt to dredge up and dig up and excavate all the resources it can muster it can engineer to stabilize reality to categorize it for eternal longevity you know it will it will put concrete walls on the very, um, on the outer boundaries of the entire universe, if it could, you know, to stabilize it so that the individual, its fetish, the self, has its place. Um, uh, modernity has, it, it's very, it's a very impoverished cosmology. And, and not to even say that there's one thing called modernity, there are many modernities, right? And it's an emerging thing it's an emerging becoming as well um, i'm speaking specifically about what we might call a snapshot of white modernity um, the one that is premised on man or the anthropos the one that wants to reshape the world in the image of the white propertied male mm. and the one that presupposes that god is dead or that the gods are dead and um, we're left to our own devices and the rational is now the sacred. The only way to meet this is with the power of reason. Um, so the enlightenment invented reason, you know, it invented nature, it invented reason, it invented the human um, in order to, um, as its resource to shape the world in the ways that, in the image of God, God is now the white property male, if, you, <laughs> if, you're, if you're following me. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, so I, I, uh, I, I do, I do think that there is, and th this may not stick with the UN or UNESCO or ECOWAS. Um, there is, a, there is room for us to, to examine the queer, to, to, to do with this recognition that has been gifted us by this explosion. You know, the recognition of irony. I think that's the greatest gift of the pandemic. The irony, uh, by irony, I mean we suddenly come to terms with the image that we think we have been propagating. We're looking at the image. We think we've been looking at this image for a long time, but suddenly something feels amiss. I don't know if you've had that experience personally, you know, where you kind of feel strange in yourself, like you're not yourself and you're examining yourself or just experiencing yourself as a not self, mm. as something other than yourself. Mm. Well, I've had that experience <laughs> where I'm like, ah, huh, this is me. And I really don't know how to frame it. And I feel that, that that embodied sense of irony seems to be alive, um, that we have been hard at work at producing this image, desensitized to the image itself. And then something comes in with messianic fervor and bursts into the room, deterritorializing our project and opens up new visions. And we're confused, but it's the confusion that is the new vision. Um, maybe I should call it convision. And, and then we see ourselves as if for the first time, the scales fall off. So it's, mm. there's so much to be said about what's happening. It's, it's uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you that saying that the new vision is the confusion actually kind of terrifies me a little uh -huh. bit. <laughs> it's a little terrifying to be confused. And, yeah. uh, and I, I think, again, I'm, I don't... I, I, Can I come in there, you know, just to... Yeah, yeah. Maybe, this, maybe experiencing this terror is the beginning of the work, mm -hmm. brother. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something comfortable about being a citizen of the global space. There's something coddling and, and <laughs> you know, warm. You know, it's just like feel at home. Never be lost. Um, if you're lost, consult Google, you know, or your, <laughs> or, your deep, or your various tools, or navigational tools. Never feel lost. Um, you don't even need a rite of passage. You don't, you don't need to be confronted by lions or by monsters in the wild. Just feel at home, you know? And it's this home-building project that is our incarceration. It's our imprisonment. It's, just, it's, it's, it's the work that is subsidized by the suffering and death of black bodies across the planet. It's the, it's, it's the home project that is subsidized by the death of the, the coral reef or, or the death of whales, you know, the killing of whales indiscriminately, mm. not for food, but just for fun. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's the, the, the world that this home has built, this home-making project has built inadvertently, I would allow, is is a toxic world we can no longer abide with for so long. And now that same home building project has spurned up this new American or American Eurocentric thing called cancel culture, you know, <laughs> which is just another, it feels like in spite of all the good intentions that are imbued, you know, or able to be discerned in that space, um, it seems like another reiteration of white, um, of white flight, of white flight into digital safety, um, and the and the horrific consequences of seeking safety in our pixelated bodies, and naming the evil, naming the other to be outside of ourselves, disallowing it any form of emergence, any form of change, any form of failure and mistake, and in the same process of disallowing the other movement we are incarcerating ourselves further, you know, because I hold you down to this rock, 
you shall not move means I cannot move too. <laughs> so it, it, it feels, it, it, maybe the terror is needed. Maybe the terrifying, the tragic is needed. And that's why the monster does not drop in through the chimneys. It doesn't say ho, ho, ho. The monster is not your friendly, bobbling, bearded old guy. The monster is the monster. The monster shows up to terrify you, but it's the work of terror to wake you up to new realities, or else you're just going to think this is all that there is. Mm-hmm.